I need remain standing. Amen. All right. Well, take your Bibles tonight and let's turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5, if you would. Matthew chapter 5. Is that better now? Okay. Matthew chapter 5. And let's read just one verse to start with tonight, and that's verse number 13. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 13. The Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Father, again tonight we're thankful for a midweek service, yeah. and I thank you for all these that have come out tonight, and I do pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we'd not be satisfied with mediocrity, but we desire every day to draw closer to you and be more Christ-like in everything about our lives. And Lord, tonight I pray if there be one that's not saved, you would save that individual or individuals. And Father, tonight for Christians that you might encourage us, strengthen us, that we would go on and serve you in a way that's glorifying to our Heavenly Father. Now bless tonight as only you can, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to ask this question, and it is this. Are you a salty Christian? Amen. And I hope tonight you are. Now, we're going to look at that definition of salt in a minute. And it had various meanings since its conception way back many, many years ago. But I want you to look back at chapter 5 and verse number 1. pastor's been preaching on the Beatitudes. And I'm not going to get into that. He's doing a wonderful job. Can't wait to hear the next one. But I want you to think about what it says, starting in verse 3. And I'm not going to read the entire verse. But let me start in verse 1. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mount, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, I'm just going to hit the highlights of these verses. Verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. My, think about that. Verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek. And remember that word meek. That has more meaning since pastors preached on that than ever before. That is strength in control. Amen? It's nothing to do with weakness or being a sissy. It's actually power under control. But then it goes on in verse 6. It says, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And then the last two verses, verse 12 and 13, it says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. You know, I thought about that. We ought to be exceeding glad that God has given us those blessings. Amen. And we can be blessed of God in a manner that you and I can have ne probably never even considered or imagined. And it says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, I know that's talking about persecution, but I'm thinking about the blessings that God has given us. Because of those blessings, we ought to be something special. Amen. We ought to be a very special people. And I think right there in verse 13, he brings it out. And we're going to look at this tonight. He said, ye are the salt of the earth. Boy, that's an important thing. Without salt, you know, not much goes on in this world. It really doesn't. And I think about, let me give you the definition. The word meanings over the years have changed. The word salty actually started back in 1440. And it was, first appearance of the word was tasting of salt, okay? Taste, tasting it, salty. But then in 1866, it became a slang with regard to sailors. Crude speech, rough, aggressive. 1936, it changed again. It talked, somebody's salty. They're explosive in anger. They get mad real easy, blow up. And then today, it's even changed more. Today, salty means feeling or showing irritation or resentment toward a person or a situation. Now, those have all changed, but for you and I, it's got a whole different meaning. Amen? It's to be an influence on those that are around us. And I wrote this, I said, but here we see Jesus teaching his disciples, describing to them what he desires of them and what we uh, be the source of happiness and blessing. Being a salty Christian is what brings the blessings into our life. Being exactly what he described in Matthew 5 and all those first verses. And, and I think he, he gives it right there. What is it that's going to please the Lord for, for, for his glory and for his honor while we're here on this earth? 
That's to be salty. Amen. That's what he wants. He wants us to be salty Christians. Now, you say, why salt? And let me give you a few things. Salt is pretty common, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody got salt? Oh, yeah, everybody got salt at the house. Uh, it's not very much. If you go buy a, a jigger of salt, what's it cost? How much? Somebody tell me. A couple bucks? Not a whole lot of money. And then I thought about this, and for most people, salt is very insignificant. They don't think much about it. They may use it, but they don't give it a lot of thought. But why would the Lord compare Christians to and desire them to be the salt of the earth? And again, I say after all the blessings the Lord has provided for us that are saved, we ought to be the salt of the earth because that's what brings him the greatest joy. Because when we're salty, guess what we're doing? We're having an influence making a difference. Now, I want to look at some areas and what salt does. And I want to compare this to our lives as Christians. Look if you, look at, look if you would at 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 19 down through 20, verse 22. I want you to see first off that salt purifies. Salt is a purifier. Uh, the city we're going to see here is the city of the, the sons of the prophets where Elisha was. And it goes on, it says, And the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. Now this is where the sons of the prophets lived. It was a nice place, a nice city, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not. And that water, that word not means bad or disagreeable or malignant. In other words, the water in that city, a beautiful city, probably nice buildings, nice surroundings, but they said the water is not. It's not good. And the ground is barren. Amen? The water's no good. Stuff in the ground's not going to grow. And it went on, and he said, Bring me a cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth under the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the water were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Now that cruise, I looked up that. When you think of uh, healing a body of water, a well of water, man, you think of using a large amount of something. That cruise, they said, could have been maybe three inches in diameter and possibly nine inches tall. It wasn't very much. But what that little bit of salt did is what? It purified that water. Now, I want you to think about this. When salt was added to the poison water, it was purified and again became usable. It became tasty. It was good. Uh, the Christian who is walking in, a, in tune with God, you mark this down, has a purifying effect. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, just one salty Christian's presence can purify the effects of people around you. They can. I mean, I think about when I was, I was an apprentice. I graduated from high school, and almost immediately I went into apprenticeship for a pipe fitter. And I had a guy that I worked with. His name, we called him Old Fred. He was already retired, but he came back out of retirement to work. His name was Fred Buckwhites, and he lived in uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And, and Fred was an unbelievable Christian, probably the first truly born-again Christian I ever met. When we were around Fred Buckwhites, guess what we never did? We never cussed. We never told any off-color jokes. We didn't do any of that. And Fred was not one of these that went around, you know, pushing things in your face. But there was no question in your mind that you knew Fred was a Christian. He'd bow his head at lunch. I don't care where he was or who was there. He'd bow his head and he'd pray for his food. Amen. Amen. And I can still remember this. And this may have been the day I got saved. I don't know that it was, but it very well could have been. We were working at, at the Westinghouse Training Center they were building two Westinghouse nuclear reactors right on Lake Michigan, and we were actually building a miniature active generator, nuclear generator. We were building and doing all the piping. One day I was in there, and I said to old Fred, here I am, 19 years old. I said, Fred, whenever I'm around you, I don't cuss. He said, I don't understand it. He said, Bill, he said, the only thing you need is Jesus as your Savior. I can remember that day as if it was yesterday. This is a cement block wall. This is the equipment room. Uh, Doug, you know what I'm talking about in these powerhouses. And they had all these banks of different parts of equipment. I can remember I walked over to the, the only way I could get in the back. There was stuff here, but there was this wall. And I can remember walking along that wall, and I said, I don't know what that means asking Jesus to save me, but if you can save me, save me. Wow. And why was that? 
It was because of one salty individual that was not ashamed to live for the Lord. Amen. And I think about when one salty Christian is around different groups and different people, the speech of those is altered very quickly. And I think about action and conduct also changes immediately. And for many, their eternal destiny will change because of one salty Christian that comes into their life. Right. But you know, the choice is ours. Do we use our influence to purify or do we use our presence to contribute to more pollution in their life? You say, how would I do that if we're not living the salty Christian life? Right. Amen. Amen. But then look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 18. Here's another one. Salt not only purifies, but also salt preserves. It's a preservative. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 23 down to verse 33, we see Abraham, and we all know this story, it was about Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I want you to know uh, that Abraham had a great influence in that decision on Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 23, and it says, Abraham drew near and said, and he's speaking to the Lord, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, can you tell how the Lord is long-suffering? Amen. Uh, Peradventure, there shall... 30 be found there, and he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be 20 found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but yet this once. Peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Now, I want you to think, if you go back, we're not going to read it, but if you go back in that same chapter, verse 17 to 21, do you know where the Lord went before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? He went to Abraham. I wonder why he went to Abraham. Did he go to Abraham because he knew Abraham walked with God? And Abraham would, would be what we consider a salty Christian. He was having an impact. He was having an influence. And I think because of Abraham's character and his walk with God, he was the one that literally preserved Lot and his family from being destroyed right. in Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. Right. And, and when uh, properly applied, I think about how this is with salt. One of the main ingredients in the process of canning and preserving is what? That's how you preserve vegetables. That's how you preserve ham. I remember when we were on the road in evangelism back in Virginia, met an old country boy, lived up in a holler. He made fiddles. He was one of the best fiddle makers probably at that time. But I said, Jack, what do you do when you're not making fiddles? He said, oh, he said, I cure a few hams now and then. I said, a few hams. Oh, and this is in the summertime. It's hot. And he said, come on with me. I'll show you them hams. We walked out, and here's this old rickety barn about to fall down. He opened that door. And in that barn and in, in pillowcases were 40 hams hanging from the rafters. In the summertime, you said, what kept them from rotten? Salt. He pulled one down and he showed me the big shank bone in that ham. They filled that with salt and they put it in the other end and they covered that thing with salt. He said, yeah, these are good hams. <laughs> He, in fact, he came to Wyoming one time and he brought one and I didn't share it with anybody. Amen. It was good. But you think about this. When salt is properly applied, it prevents putrefaction. It does and decay. Uh, and it's with the ham and, and the, the pork like that. But I wonder tonight, don't you think that, that a salty Christian ought to have an influence on the masses in this world today? Don't you think we all have the ability in some way to preserve them uh, from dying and burning in a devil's hell? Yeah. 
because of our salty influence will help preserve them from destruction. And I think that's exactly what Abraham did with his family. I think about America. We're in a, we're in a terrible state as a country right now. But I love pastor's optimism. He's so optimistic, it's been rubbing off on me, and I, I just try to get it off, but it just sticks, amen? <laughs> but he's optimistic, and he's right. You know what? We have nothing to worry about because we have the Lord. He is our answer to everything, and he's going to take care of us. I, I think about how that many of these in foreign countries that are going through all these persecutions and stuff, do you know what? They're trusting in the Lord forever, uh, for everything, and that's their preserving element in their life as a Lord, and we can be the same for other people Amen. that we come in contact with. I wonder tonight, are you going to be a preserver, or are you going to contribute to decay? Look over at Daniel 9, look at chapter 1 and verse 8. Here's another one, salt permeates. You say, well, that's a big word, what's it mean? It means to spread without or to distribute. And that's what salt does. If you look here at Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, Daniel was a man that had great influence. He did. In, in chapter 1 and verse 8 it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the princes of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Boy, that's a guy that had some guts. Amen? Amen. He stood on what he believed according to his God. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking uh, than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. In other words, that eunuch said, Listen, you're asking me to do something that caused me my life. He said, This king has said you're going to eat this and you're going to drink this, and if I go against that king, he'd kill me. But look what it goes on to say. Then said, he, then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fatter and fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children would did eat the portion of the king's meat. Amen. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Now I wonder, do you think Daniel influenced that guy? You bet he did. He probably opened his eyes to something he'd never seen before, and it was not an idol. Very possibly opened his eyes to the living God of heaven. Amen. And then it goes on and it says, For these four children God gave them knowledge and skill and all lean, learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king commanded uh, communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Boy, listen to this. Salty Christian stood his ground, and he did not move. And, and what happened? Uh, the saltiness in Daniel permeated to and around the people he was with. Amen. Then verse 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And you think about that. You and I, if we're salty Christians, we're going to permeate. We're going to affect those that are around us. Everyone that Daniel came in contact was was influenced. And I think especially King Darius. I believe Darius, as a result of Daniel's saltiness, ended up getting saved somewhere down the road. I mean, if you read the end of that story. And I think about when salt is added to any substance. If you put a little bit here, that salt will affect all the area that it's near. There's no question about that. And so this is what a salty Christian should do. Everywhere we go, our saltiness ought to permeate those that are around us. It ought to affect those that are around us. And we should impact everyone that we come in contact with for the glory of God. Amen. And I'm talking about for good, the Amen. saltiness that would be a godly thing that would affect those we're around. Uh, and I think about for salt to have an effect, guess what? It's got to come in contact with something. I think sometimes, folks, we need to all get out and visit. That's how we permeate 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how the salt goes around. Some people stay home in their little little place of refuge and they don't get out. You're not going to be effective for the Lord if you don't get out to where your saltiness can affect Amen. others around right. you. Amen. Right. But then look at first, Second Kings chapter 5 and verse number 1. I want you, to, and this is a good one for our children. Children ought to be listening tonight real good. Amen? A little salt goes a long ways. Amen? Look here with the, the story about Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria. Verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. But look at the last part. What does it say? He was a leper, not a good thing. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive of the land of Israel. Now look at these next three words. What does it say? A what? Boy, y'all there yet? A little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus saith the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Now skip down, and I'm trying to, for time's sake, look down at verse number 9. So Naaman, they sent a message to the king. The king got all flustered. He says, who does he think I am? I'm God and I can do this. But then anyway, so we see in verse 9, And Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now, how did that, that great man that was a leper, how did he find out where to go? It was one little tiny salty maid. Amen. Don't tell me children can't have an influence on others for the Lord. Amen? Right. And then it goes on. It says, And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hands over the place and recover the leper. But he didn't do that. But you know what? That man was influenced by just a little bit of salt. Right. wasn't very big. I remember when my father got saved. My dad was 73 years old when he got saved. He was raised in the Catholic Church. He was an altar boy. He thought his baptism washed away his sin. But over the years, when we ran, I ran from the Lord. My dad watched. He saw when we went to Bible college. And my dad came the year before I graduated. And I still remember I took him fishing. Dad was crippled with polio as a boy. And one leg was four inches shorter, and now he's in his 70s. He had a hard time getting around. But I took him to a lake there in Oklahoma City, and we fished for a little bit. And on our way back home, here was the leading question. My dad asked me, he said, what's wrong with your kids? I said, okay, what'd they do? He said, oh, they didn't do anything, but there's something wrong with them. I said, what's, what are you talking about? He said on Sunday morning, they get up, get dressed, and they go to church before you ever say anything. I said, okay. He said, that's not normal. Amen. I, I said, well, maybe it's not. But I said, Dad, both of those kids are saved. I said, they're Christians. And I said, they love the Lord. I said, that's why they get up. And that's why they go to Sunday school. You don't have to say anything. They know what is right, and they want to do it. I believe that was the leading thing that led my dad to get saved. It was a little bit of salt, a little salt and child. I think of all the children we have here. These children can have an impact and influence on those that are around. And I wonder tonight, mom and dad, you ought to encourage your kids to live for God while they're young. Encourage them to read the Bible. Read the Bible with them. Pray with them. Just teach them to love God and be an influence. Okay, look over at Acts chapter 26 and look at verse 24. Here's another one. Salt so purifies, it preserves, it's, it permeates anything it comes in contact with, and a little bit of salt will go a long ways. But then I want you to see this, salt also seasons. In chapter 26 and verse 24, down to verse 28, it says, And as he, was, he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Now, we know that Paul was a guy that loved the Lord. 
He loved the Lord, and he was a salty Christian. And he had a great influence on everybody he had come in contact with, not just the common people, but with people of all levels. And then it goes on. It says, but he, he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, what is the next words? Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I think about the main reason most of us use salt is to make things taste better. How many of you like salt? Amen. Amen. How many of you like a lot of salt? I do too. It's not good for you, they say, but it sure does taste good. But you think about in our Christian life, we should cause Christianity to taste good to those around us. They ought to see something in us that they don't have and they realize it. And they ought to be able to see that just like with Paul, Paul's conduct was a, a desirable thing to most people. Look at King Agrippa. He looked at Paul and he said, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Amen. And what was that about? That was all about his salty influence that he had in his life. And I wonder tonight, you don't have to compromise to get a lost, dying world to taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. You know what we need to do? I don't believe in lifestyle evangelism by itself. A lot of people say, well, just live it for them, and that's all you need to do. I don't believe that. I think you need to live it before them, but you need to tell them about it too. But when we live that lifestyle, Fred Buckwhite's, why did I go to Fred Buckwhite's and say what I did? Because I saw in Fred Buckwhite something that I didn't have, that I did not understand, had no clue about, but he had something different. And I think that's the exact same thing. When we are a salty Christian, the seasoning we have, they'll see that what we have is good, and they'll want to taste and see the Lord as well. Amen. But then look at John chapter 4, and look at verse 4 through 15. Salt all makes, also makes you thirsty. Boy, Jesus is at the well with that woman. You remember the story, the Samaritan woman? In verse 4 it says, And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Now this was an unusual comment to come from a Jew to a Samaritan. Because the Jews called the Samaritans what? Dogs. They looked down on them. They, they were not, uh, didn't want anything to do with them. And then it goes on and it says, Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. I think about a salty Christian will cause sinners to desire the, to thirst for the word of God. Amen. I think about... We were just listening on our way to church tonight about Unshackled. How many ever listened to Unshackled on 107? Amen. And it was talking, and I only caught the, the latter part of the story, but this guy was a Muslim, and he was trying to get Muslim converts. He was trying to win people over to Islam, and he was doing everything he could. He would go to churches, into the churches, and try to talk to the people in churches, but he was having no effect. And then finally, he went to an independent Baptist church, it said, and he went in, and he, he went with the same purpose, trying to find somebody he could sway that would maybe be weak in their Christianity or was not saved, and he could convince them that Islam was the way to go. And anyway, he got in there, and some salty Christian came up to him and started talking to him. Amen. And uh, 
their, their, their story that they gave of the gospel on how Jesus died and how he rose again and he died for that man's sin. Oh boy, the guy was absolutely moved. And it wasn't long that he actually got a hold of the pastor of that church and he, he said, I'd like to come back. And so he went back to the church and he sat through his service and they gave the invitation and he went forward in the invitation and the pastor asked him, he said, uh, uh, do you, why are you coming? He said, well, I've, I understand the truth. I'm a Muslim, but I understand the truth of the word of God. I'm thirsty. I want to know more. I want to know more about Jesus. Well, anyway, the guy got saved and then the guy that was his mentor for Islam, trying to teach him how to get converts, he called him on the phone and he told him, I'm not doing it anymore. He said, why not? He said, I became a Christian. Amen. The guy said, you're an infidel. And he hung up on him. Amen. Well, anyway, the whole story as it went, he went back to his country. His parents rejected him. And finally, little by little, as he continued to live for the Lord, they ended up getting saved. Amen. Hey, listen, you and I we need to be the influence and make people thirsty for the things of God. And by the way, we can do it by living a life that is pleasing to God and just be salty. But then this is the last one, and this is a little different. Uh, salt purifies, it preserves, it permeates whatever it touches. And a little bit of it goes a long ways, and salt will season, makes things taste good. And salt also will make you thirsty. And we ought to be, we ought to be, if we're not thirsty for the things of God, why would anybody else want to be thirsty for it? Amen. Amen. But the last one is this, salt irritates. And it does. I think about this. If you get salt in an open wound, get salt in your eye. Get salt in something that's raw. You mark it down. It's going to burn and it's going to ir irritate. And I think about how a salty Christian cannot always go along to get along. There's a time when we don't go along anymore just to get along. Right. There's a time when we have to take a stand. And when we don't go along, do you know what happens? It's going to be an irritant to those that are around us because we're more concerned about the Savior than we are the world and what they're doing. And I think about it comes to a point that we've got to take a stand for what's right. And I think today what we're seeing going on in the world, that it's time for Christians to stand up. I really believe that. We've got that on our side out there. We support Israel. I'm not ashamed of that, and I'll stand for it. Amen? Amen. And we need to do that. I think about the little maid, just one little maid, just a, a, a refugee, basically, that comes in, and she had a reputation, evidently, with the wife and with the master, enough to where he listened to what she said and went and ended up getting saved. That's the same thing that all of us need to do in here tonight. If we don't maintain our salty, godly influence and have an effect on society, who's going to do it? Right. If we don't do it, and I'm not saying just Brother Grandy, and I'm not saying myself and our Sunday school teachers. I'm saying everybody in this building tonight, we ought to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, be a salty influence on this society. Right. And I think what we ought to do is we ought to pray every, every day that the Lord would give us the ability to maintain a salty influence and character. Every morning, get up and Lord say, Lord, make me salty. Not in the way the world looks at salty people, but in the way we've seen described tonight in the Word of God. And you know what? God commands us to be the salt of the earth. You know what we need to do? Get after it and do it. Yeah. And I hope tonight you'll think about it, that you need to be saltier than you are. We all need to stand for what's right. And God will use us if we just allow ourselves to yield to the Holy Spirit of God and allow him to direct and guide us in this life. I want to make a difference. I really do. And I know you guys do too. But we have to make a concerted effort to get it done. And we ought to do it, if we all did it in here as a group, as a church, what would happen to Cedar County, Missouri? What would happen to the state of Missouri? It could be the revival we've been praying for. It could start right here in this group with these people tonight if we would all desire to be that salty Christian. Right. Let's bow our heads, please. Right. Amen. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder tonight if there might be one that would be here say, Preacher, if I were to die, I'm not even sure I'm going to heaven. I wonder tonight if there might be one say, just pray for me. I need to be saved. Anybody at all tonight like that? You'd slip a hand up. How many tonight, your prayer and your desire would be, I want to be 
a salty Christian. I want to be the salt of the earth. I want to influence people for the glory of God. How many of that would be your prayer? Let me see your hand. Put it up high. Amen. Almost everybody in here tonight. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the stories that you've given us that we can see and that we can apply to our lives. And Lord, tonight we are the salt of the earth. And I pray tonight that we'd have a desire to be exactly that, that we would have an influence in every way we've seen described in scripture tonight. And we'd not be satisfied until we are. Bless the invitation tonight. I don't know what anybody needs to come. Maybe they need to come tonight and just get alone with you, Lord, and just say, I want to be that salty Christian. Lord, give me the ability. And, Father, I know that you'll do exactly your part if we do ours. Now, bless the invitation tonight, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed.